Brian. Fabulous. We've got Brian from Northern Ontario, Canada. Amazing. Welcome. If you're just joining us, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your name and where you're joining us from. And also, if you have any experience in sustainability or sustainable nutrition, let us know. Let us know if you're a total beginner, too. All Everybody is welcome here. So just let us know where you're coming from and what your experience level is. And we are going to get started in just a minute. Just a reminder that this is being recorded. So if you have not yet double checked that you are on mute, please go ahead and double check that. You'll see a little red mic in the left hand corner crossed out if you're muted. Please also feel free to add your pronouns by editing your name on Zoom to let us know um, your pronouns. All right, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So my name is Aitem Salahi, and today um, we are gonna be speaking to all of you about sustainability in food and nutrition careers. So um, this is today's agenda. We're just going to chat a little bit about what our norms and etiquette are going to be for the call. I'm going to let you know a little bit more about who we are at the Planetary Health Collective. And then I'm going to pass it off to Mary, who is our Director of Education at the Planetary Health Collective, who is going to moderate a panelist discussion with our three panelists with you today. And Bretta Alstrom, our Director of Operations, will be moderating the chat. So please feel free to send any questions that you have throughout the course of the presentation about the content, about you know, THC, of, you know, how to connect with any of the speakers directly into the chat box. And then at the end, we're gonna let you all know how you can get more involved with THC. So briefly, everybody's been on Zoom for like the last year and a half straight. So you probably all know the rules by now, but please double check that your line is muted. Um, if you have not yet done so, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your name how you found us, what attracted you to the event, where you're calling from, any, any fun tidbits that you want us to know about. And then please also practice respect while you're here on this call. This is a safe, diverse, and identity affirming space. So hate speech or bullying of any kind will result in an immediate uh, removal from the call, which I know is not going to be a problem. Um, please also participate. So the chat feature is fabulous. We're gonna be asking you some questions throughout the course of the presentation, and we invite you to let us know your thoughts share any questions that you're having, share any, you know, aha moments or light bulb moments that come up as we move through. Um, so we would just love to hear from you and make this as engaging and interactive. It's an hour, but these events go by very, very quickly, especially because of how interactive it is on panel nature. Uh, lastly, we are sharing, um, we're going to be sharing a link to accept donations in the chat box. So you can send that directly through PayPal. And if you have any questions, you can either use the raise hand feature or you can type your question directly into the chat box and Bretta will be making a list and we will do our best to get to all of the audience questions in our audience Q&A at the very end of the session. So who is the Planetary Health Collective? We are a movement to mitigate climate change and nourish human health by leveraging the unique role of food and nutrition professionals in the fight. So we essentially created this community, the Planetary Health Collective, because we, uh, Mary, Bretta, and I saw a gap. There is a strength of passion that we have in the food and nutrition field to use our profession in every way that we possibly can to have an impact on our patient populations and in other ways as well. And there's a huge amount of interest and momentum around this topic of sustainable nutrition. What does it really mean? How can we, what levers are there that are available to us in food system strengthening and food system work that can help us to combat climate change and not just be climate neutral, but climate resilient and climate restorative. So that is, those are the topics that we explore in the Planetary Health Collective. We welcome individuals from all walks of life, from all um, experience levels to kind of get involved. And our mission is to activate, incubate, and elevate everyone's potential in this fight to use food and nutrition as the lever to fight climate change. Our vision is to provide an opportunity for all food and nutrition <sighs> professionals to find a way to get plugged into this work to channel their unique passions and skills to counter the climate crisis. So our whole motto again is to educate, incubate, and activate. We teach our members how to connect the dots between yeah. food, climate, labor, racial, and health justice, and yeah. provide educational opportunities to instill these notions among food and nutrition leaders. We also welcome community members of all experience levels to incubate that leadership. And then we 
together, identify opportunities to take action together, as well as alongside our allies in the fight to forge a path forward for systemic change using food and climate at the local, state, and federal levels. So I'm going to pass it off to Mary now. She's going to let you guys briefly know what the structure of the panel is going to be, and we're going to hand it off to our panelists. Thank you, Aiten. Um, I'm Mary Purdy. I am the education lead with uh, Planetary Health Collective, and I'm just thrilled to be here tonight with you all. Thank you so much for attending. And we're going to have a great conversation. We have three amazing dietitians with us tonight, all of whom will be presenting a little bit about what they do, who they are, and their experience as a professional working in that sustainability space. And, and then we'll have an opportunity for both us to ask some questions and for you, the participants of this panel or this participants of this webinar to ask your questions of these fantastic panelists. So without, I, I'd love to actually find out real quick before we get started in the chat, would you please give a star uh, looking a little bit something like this, if you have gotten any kind of training uh, in sustainability or context, either in your curriculum at the place where you attended grad school or undergrad, or um, any kind of training in your in the curriculum in your dietetic internship. Th throw a, a, a star into the chat if you've had any kind of um, sustainability training. Okay, I'm seeing some here. Excellent. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much. And I also am seeing a lot of folks who are interested in potentially shifting careers and or potentially expanding their careers. And that is really our goal tonight in helping you to understand the many ways that dietitians and nutrition professionals and people working in the food and nutrition space can play a role and be an agent for change in a more sustainable and equitable food system and helping to mitigate uh, both the impacts of climate change and the potential for uh, shifting the climate change conversation in a different and more hopefully more hopeful direction. So without any further ado, I'm gonna get started with introducing our first panelist and that is Shireen Chow. So Shireen, and you're uh, welcome to start sharing your screen, Shireen. Um, Shireen is an award-winning dietitian and chef focused on building a more equitable and sustainable food system through the intersection of plant-based nutrition, food, and social justice. She has collaborated with national brands and institutions to build innovative programs that focus on culinary nutrition and community empowerment. She also co-developed the first Certificate of Training on Sustainable Food Systems for the Academy, which I highly recommend to y'all, and she co-founded Food Planet Board, an initiative to empower health care professionals to transform the food system. Welcome, Shireen, and we're delighted to have you here. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, I'm excited to be here. So uh, Mary just kind of went through this. So I'm going to go on to my next slide and share a little bit about how I um, got, you know, became interested in my career route. Um, this is just brief and I know we'll have a discussion later on. So um, I'm actually a career change RD. So I know a lot of you are interested in changing your career. I used to work in tech. Um, I was working in global supply chain uh, for Hewlett Packard. And so totally different. Um, I've always had a passion for food and I knew I wanted to go to culinary school and I actually never knew any dietitians. And so I had to like learn about all of these different things um, just through my own research. And so in 2010, I moved to New York City. Um, I started uh, with culinary school first um, at the Natural Gourmet Institute at the time. And now it's um, converted to ICE, the Culinary Institute. And I also worked in the New York City farmers market. So really focused on community from the very start. Um, and we went to a lot of different farmers markets and they had this amazing program called Stellar Farmers Market where we had a culinary, um, a culinary nutritionist, we had a dietitian, and then we also had a translator at a lot of the different spots. So we were able to create these different educations um, to the community with the food that was available there and also match their um, market dollars. So that was pretty amazing and a cool introduction into what um, community sustainability and community nutrition really look like. And um, throughout my culinary school, I you know, really learned a lot about 
food, wellness, and I also have a background um, where my family's really focused on that, of really focused on holistic medicine. So I kind of grew up with that, but solidifying that with some formal training because I really was interested in the culinary aspects of nutrition. And I was able to get into um, Sodexo's internship, which at the time was focused on leadership. And through each of my rotations, um, aside from the clinical one, I was really able to craft and find locations because they had locations everywhere um, that focused on sustainability. So with my preceptors, uh, each of my rotations, I focused, uh, whether it was food service, uh, focusing on sustainability, helping them um, engage more of the local farmers um, and curate different foods um, based on, you know, what, what they were looking for in that location. So I know that it can vary a lot, but um, that was my experience. I chose a university that was really focused on sustainability and was able to do my rotation there. And then I had an elective rotation as well. And I seeked out different dietitians who at the time were really focused on sustainability and communications. And so being able to learn from different dietitians who are already doing things in the culinary and sustainability space really helped me um, weave a lot of different experiences together. And then when I became a dietitian, I was able to work at this really amazing innovative nonprofit program called LA Kitchen. And that is a sister kitchen to DC Central Kitchen. And there we were able to work with not only um, reducing food waste, uh, but also engage in a lot of different populations where we had a culinary job training program for people coming out of prison, former foster youth, um, as well as um, former um, uh, former foster youth and then formerly houseless individuals. And then we also worked uh, with a, con a large congregate meal program. So it was kind of all different aspects of sustainability and community nutrition weaved together into one program. And then um, from that, um, I started working on building my own practice uh, focused on sustainability. And I continue to be very involved and that's the last two images you see on the right hand side, um, which I'll get into a little bit more as well, but I'm very involved in the academy and also in the last dietary guidelines round in 2020, um, I was able to represent a few different groups um, and to speak on behalf of them to be really engaged in that process of policy. So here's um, another photo of an organization I'm a part of. So this is the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative. And this is again, focused on the culinary nutrition aspects. Um, and this is a network of different kitchens uh, throughout the country. And I want to share this kitchen specifically because this is actually the Free Library of Philadelphia. And this huge, massive kitchen is actually in the library. So being able to create these different innovative programs that really engage the community on culinary literacy was such a cool idea. And I think that it could really be utilized across the country. So these teaching kitchens are in a lot of different facilities, corporate settings, schools, universities, community settings. And this is one of the examples of a community setting. And then I wanted to go back to um, becoming a little bit more involved with the academy. Um, I've been involved throughout, you know, when I was a student, uh, when I was an intern, and then also, you know, now in my career, I've been continued to be involved. I know it can be a little bit confusing early on, and I was really confused until I started uh, learning more about the academy and becoming more involved. And I was able to be the chair for a vegetarian nutrition practice group for the past three years. And then now I've transitioned to another role um, as the diversity liaison. And not only nationally, but you can also become involved locally. And so on the right hand side, you see that um, that's the California Academy. Each state has their own academy as well. And so being able to go with my state, I serve as the policy liaison um, with my district um, to my congressperson. And then um, on the bottom right, which is also another thing, um, I was asked to help co-create the first certificate of training on sustainable food systems. And I was able to help develop one of the four modules there. And this is one last thing. 
Um, in 2019, me and uh, three other dietitians co-founded this organization called Food and Planet. And our goal is to empower healthcare professionals to focus on sustainable food systems, uh, to be more culturally responsive, culturally responsive, as well as for di different dimensions of sustainable food. And we were able to create um, and build out this masterclass and have had over 8,000 people attend um, and host different panels. And then also wanted to share that we will be launching our very first white paper um, in a couple of months or actually next month. So I hope to share that with everyone soon. Thank you so much. And I think I will turn it over to uh, Mary. Thank you so much, Shireen. That was fantastic. And just so great to understand the history behind where you got to where you are today. And I can't recommend Food and Planet um, more to folks. Uh, it's just a fantastic resource. And we're so excited about that white paper. So thank you for all the great work you've done. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker. Fallon Bader is a registered dietitian, avid cook, and owner of the business, The Sprouting Kitchen. She served as a food corp service member, helping to incorporate nutrition and gardening into schools in New Mexico and Hawaii. Fallon also serves as the PHC, or the Planetary Health Collective Culinary Committee Chair, and is the chair of HEN, the Hunger and Environmental Nutrition Practice Group, which if you don't know about and aren't a member of, I also highly recommend. Welcome, Fallon. Uh, take it away. I wasn't unmuted yet, there we go. Sometimes when you're sharing the screen, it's hard to see. Um, hi everyone, I'm Fallon, thanks for the introduction. And um, I'm gonna be telling you about my story here and mostly about the business that I started, which is the Sprouting Kitchen. So my story begins back in uh, really 2015 when I was doing my dietetic internship. And um, at that time, I. I really didn't have much of a background in sustainability or really much with growing food. Uh, and I was involved in a kind of a, like a garden to table program during my internship. And I realized in that moment that the kids who were part of the program I was helping run knew more about growing vegetables than I did, or really growing food in general. Um, and I was really intrigued. I wanted to get more involved in the sustainability um, growing food movement. So I joined Food Corps, which is an AmeriCorps service program where you get to work with school gardens um, all around the nation to help build them. Um, and that's what brought me out to New Mexico. I'm originally from the East Coast. Uh, and I was started my um, service in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where uh, it was really great. I got to work with a whole slew of different gardens, but mostly uh, I got to really get to know the local food community here in Albuquerque, which was really eye-opening for me. Um, I, in particular, got to know a farmer. His name is Lorenzo Candelaria. He's a seventh generation Native American Hispanic farmer here. And when I would go to his farm, I just wanted to eat everything that he grew. He had so much wisdom. I had learned so much from him and other farmers in my area. And it really changed the way I viewed food. Even though I'd just become a registered dietitian, it was a whole new perspective for me. And I realized being outside on farms, seeing food growing was really the best way to teach about nutrition. So me and uh, Lorenzo, or Lorenzo and I, we started um, talking about, you know, he was like encouraging me, why don't we do some events on the farm? And we started a cooking event uh, on the farm, it went really well. And at that moment, I realized this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to kind of bring people onto farms and teach about cooking and nutrition. And then, well, there he is, there's Lorenzo. Um, I won a grant with Siggy's Yogurt that helped me really get started and buying some equipment for the classes. And we uh, officially started doing classes back in May of 2019. And just to give you a picture of what our classes look like. So it's essentially a pop-up kitchen on different local farms here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. 
Um, so what happens is we go to different farms for each class. And when we get to the farm, I, um, with my team, set up our kitchen on the farm. Then the farmer welcomes us to the farm and gives us a tour of the farm, shows us what's growing. Then we um, break in to groups after I've taught a brief kind of nutrition culinary education um, session. And then we break into groups and we cook a couple different meals, all focused on the produce that is on the farm. So, you know, it's hands-on cooking. People are seeing where the produce is grown, then they're cooking it. We're outside, you can see beautiful views. And then lastly, we share what we have made together and that kind of completes the full picture of seeing where the food is grown, cooking it, and then the ability to taste it. Here are some um, meals that we've made over the last couple of years. Um, and so who is our audience? So first we sell tickets to our classes on my website and that's kind of for the general public, people who can pay out of pocket for a class. Um, secondly, I wanted to make sure that these classes were really accessible to everyone. Um, a lot of the farm to table movement, um, unfortunately, is for people who can pay for that kind of experience, right? So I've partnered with different um, hospitals, farmers market association, um, universities to help fund our classes uh, so that they are free to lower income populations and really just increasing access. Um, we've even built a farm helped different farms build farm stands on their classes so that folks can use, um, if they have SNAP benefits, they can use them after our class to purchase uh, produce. So that's kind of our audience. Um, and then just kind of a little update. So that was 2019, 2020, we had all these plans. Of course, the pandemic happened. So we moved to teaching classes virtually online for pretty much the, since the pandemic started which was actually a really great opportunity to kind of, um, you know, meet people in a different way. And then back to the current right now, we are kind of doing a hybrid where we have some online offers um, and now we are back to doing classes outside. So kind of giving you a glimpse of what the Sprouting Kitchen looks like. Um, we are kind of learning and evolving every day. And uh, I hope this paints a picture of how really connecting community to farms in our local community, cooking together, and um, really a glimpse at a very local program that we have here. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Fallon. Um, it's just so inspiring to see you bringing food to, to kids, getting them started at an early age, seeing you make this kind of farm to table uh, more accessible to all people. I think that's a huge disconnect for a lot of folks when it comes to thinking about what sustainability means and sustainable for whom is often the question that we ask. So thank you for that great work. Um, all right, we are now gonna hear from our final speaker, Joanne. And let me introduce you to Joanne. So Joanne Filemon is a registered dietitian with over 15 years of experience in the field of nutrition. She is the owner of Wonderfully Nutritious Solutions, helping individuals and families improve their health through lifestyle changes and better eating habits. She's also on the advisory board of the Food and Wellness Equity Collective, who is one of uh, PHC's partners, and we love supporting the work that they are doing. So just another great resource. Um, I hope that Breda or Aitan will put that into the, the chat so you also can uh, see the, the great work that those folks are doing over there. So without any further ado, um, Joanne, take it away. Hi, everyone. As Mary stated, I am Joanne Feilman. Uh, I am a registered dietitian out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so I originally started in long-term care. I think I saw someone um, ask something about that, being in long-term care in um, the chat. So I started out in long-term care coming um, straight out of my clinical work. And um, one of the biggest hospitals here in Atlanta is um, Grady Health. And Grady has a um, long-term care attached to it. And that long-term care facility um, sees all of the 
people who are stable enough to be shipped to um, long-term care from the Grady Hospital. And the, the, the demographics out there was predominantly minorities who had, you know, never seen regular meals in a day um, in a long time and coming out into long-term care, they, you know, got breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they had to become um, accustomed to that, but afraid that if they left, what would happen, um, you know, they wouldn't have access to that anymore. Um, so that was a, a, a eye opener for me. Um, so I, I grew up here in the United States, but I was born in Haiti. So I grew up in a Haitian American family where, um, you know, my parents focused a lot on um, holistic um, medicine and our foods came, uh, a lot of it came from the backyard. Our, our herbs came from the backyard um, of, the, of, of our home. And so I grew up in, in that whole food thinking. Um, and that's, that's the way a lot of people do it in Haiti. And that's the way my parents raised me. And so coming out of school and going from that mindset of what they taught us as to be um, what was healthy and what was nutritious and what I grew up on. Um, oftentimes, even though the foods were whole foods that I was eating, um, but eating um, white rice, for instance, I felt ashamed that <laughs> I was a dietitian that was eating foods that they were telling us were not the healthiest of foods. So from, from that thinking, um, coming out of school, going into the clinical setting, getting the actual hands-on experience and seeing how um, telling people the textbook, uh, textbook um, information and education of what they should be doing wasn't going to work. And it would not work with a lot of the, you know, most of the communities um, that I worked with and, you know, predominantly the Black community. And so I had to reshift my thinking and so that I can help people understand how they can um, have a sustainable uh, lifestyle without having to change so much of what they're used to um, growing up or what makes them who they are. And so that's what really got me into um, wanting to show others um, in my private practice, on social media, how I've incorporated um, how I, I'm raising my family and how I was raised uh, using the nutrition concepts that I learned uh, um, and, and merging them with old traditions, I guess you can say, and um, doing a backyard. So, you know, I don't work with any farms or anything like that, but I do my backyard is what I call it, or you can call it your patio. You may not have a backyard, the table kind of thinking. Um, and you don't, you know, a lot of people think that they have to have like, you know, a huge garden to, to make an impact, but you can start out uh, small and then migrate to something bigger if you can. So I do a lot of that, um, you know, uh, education when I'm talking to my clients, although my practice is predominantly focused on holistic anti-inflammatory therapies. I do a lot of gut health um, therapies for my clients. Um, oftentimes, you know, they are, you know, wanting to you know, have access to things that are more um, whole or things, foods that they feel like are, 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 are um, going to help them with their health. And, you know, I, I tell them, you know, you can grow some of the stuff. You can grow, you know, cayenne pepper. You can grow anything in your backyard or anything in a pot. It doesn't even have to go in the ground. It all depends on, um, you know, the motivation that you have to want to do it. Um, and then so, you know, I've often found that it's, you know, uh, especially in the minority in the black community, people find it overwhelming to want to live a healthier lifestyle because they feel like they have to leave everything that they know behind um, when it comes to um, sustainable nutrition. Um, and my, my goal is to make people see that you don't have to leave your culture. You don't have to, um, you know, eat the way society is telling us we're supposed to eat only um, for you to have a sustainable, nutritious lifestyle. So those are my goals. I don't have a, um, an official background in sustainable um, nutrition. I 
just jumped into it and <laughs> I'm, I'm helping people in my practice and what I share on social media, see that it's not as hard as we like to think it is to be able to um, grow a little something in the backyard. I'm raising four boys right now and I want them as well to see that where the food is coming from, how you know we are growing it, that it's not just coming from the grocery store. And I'm trying to be less dependent on you know the foods that I'm purchasing in the stores and more um, independent with what I'm growing at home. So that's my story. Thank you, Joanne. Um, so great to hear that personal component of this. And thank you for bringing in the cultural aspect because I think that often gets um, either misunderstood or uh, dietitians get misguided around that and really understanding how important it is to incorporate cultural relevance and um, cultural humility in the, in, the, in the discussion around food and what's appropriate for whom and what actually people are traditionally used to eating. So thank you for bringing that in. It's, it's such a key okay. part of the conversation. Um, let's get all of our panelists, if you can all uh, join us, uh, Shireen and Fallon and Joanne, I have a few questions and then we'll take some questions. We've been getting some questions in the chat and please continue uh, everybody out there to, to, uh, to ask your questions uh, of these fabulous minds. Um, and one thing you know that's, that's super interesting with Joanne with what you just were saying is that you are able to take an experience that you're having right now in a private practice. And I would imagine many dietitians are thinking to themselves, how can I bring in sustainability? I don't have any training. And you are a perfect example of somebody who's actually taken not only your personal experience, but something very easy to implement, like growing your own food on, in a very even basic level on, in your kitchen um, or in your backyard. So for the dietitians out there who feel overwhelmed by trying to somehow get a new master's degree in this field, mm -hmm. it, it can really can be as simple as that. Yeah. Um, I am curious uh, for, for Fallon and, Sh and Shireen as well, um, what do, have you found to be an effective educational tool um, since maybe you, you may not have gotten all of the training that you needed to, to do exactly what you are doing or many dietitians don't get that kind of training. What have you found to be one of the most valuable educational tools um, to help you get to where you are right now? Um, I could go first. I think just with, uh, with anything, you know, um, some learning experience. So being able to not only interview people who are already doing it, um, to even see what's possible. I think that even understanding what sustainability means can mean so many different things to so many different people. So understanding in that aspect, what area you might be interest, most interested in, um, and also taking on different internships or reading a little bit more about um, what different aspects are on, in sustainability. I know when I, like I said, if you are, are going into your internship, if you're able to craft an internship rotation that you can touch on or learn a little bit more about these aspects, that's the best way to learn is to do something hands-on. Yeah, I, th I think example is one of the greatest tools that I, I, I use is showing people what I do and how you two can do it as well. It's, mm -hmm. it's easier for me to be able to explain to people when I've, you know, touched it and done it myself. So I think example is a great way for me to, um, to teach others. Um, and I would just add too, like, I, I love the idea of, um, like growing your own food and, and making it work in your backyard. Um, and then I also think we have to think about like food on a large scale, like who is growing the food that's really feeding everyone. Um, and you don't have to be a farmer to talk about sustainability, but I think that let's like talk to farmers, go out into your community and make sure you're having those conversations with them because truly they are the ones who are feeding mm -hmm. large amounts of people. And um, I, I mean, I always say like my best teachers in sustainability have been the farms that I work with. Um, and I think that people are usually uh, a little nervous to approach farmers. Um, they tend to not be the most socially 
uh, apt people sometimes too. Um, but like say, hey, if you know a farmer, look them up on social media or go to your farmer's market and ask them if they take volunteers on their farm. They're usually pretty open to people coming to help weed. And that's a great way to get your foot in the door, start having conversations with the people um, who are growing food for your community. Uh, and like, I think that's, I would take that over like going back and getting a master's degree in sustainability. I mean, I would still do that too, if I could do it, but like, it's free. It's a great way to get know, let's to get to know your community. So it's like always my number one tip. Excellent. And even just hearing the three of you speak, um, you know, having access to these kinds of panels where you're hearing what people are doing, or as someone was mentioning those informational interviews, I know that was critical for me in terms of understanding who's out there doing what and in what way and everyone you speak to has a different perspective or says you should check out this resource. So those are those are great ideas. Uh, all of you have talked a little bit about communications, um, whether that's in uh, social media realm or in speaking how do you feel communication skills and social media and speaking um are helping you to to dispense this this or disperse this this information that seems so critical and how can people use those communication skills and those platforms to help bring about um more understanding of these issues Social media has been excellent. I mean, especially in this these last 18 months, everyone can agree to the fact that we may not have been able to see each other in person, but the access to social media um, and being at home all the time gave you more time to be able to be on social media and see what everyone is doing. And for me, that really helped me connect with a lot of people, um, you know, and connect with people I may not have been able to connect to if I was just doing just focused on my private practice and not doing social media at all. So I think, um, you know, finding different methods of communication that works for you, different platforms, whether you're joining an organization, whether you're using social media, whether it's your private practice, whatever works for you, I think it's very important for you to find that so that you're able to um, reach the group that's, you know, relatable to you, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, going off of that, the connection piece is so critical and being able to connect with other people that you might not have access to, I think, before all of these, you know, Instagram and other tools were out there, um, you would just have to somehow stalk them online and then somehow <laughs> try to find some sort of contact. But, you know, through social media, you know, the last 10 and a half, you know, 10, 15 years, um, you're able to learn more about people, learn more about organizations and even reach out to them, which is such a huge advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just add, um, I personally don't love Facebook for whatever reason, but <laughs> There's so much, um, there's so many Facebook groups out there. So, you know, joining one like sustainability and nutritionists, like whatever, whatever you're interested in, there's a Facebook group for that. So um, that's like another just unexpected, nah, it's not unexpected. It's pretty usual <laughs> place to look. And sometimes as, as dietitians or nutrition professionals, people working in this food uh, culinary health space, we often are siloed into our own uh, areas. And I think it can be so empowering to work across sectors and collaborate with non-nutrition professionals. Mm -hmm. So who have you found, and maybe this has been surprising to you, who have you found to be some amazing power partners in non-nutrition professionals who have either been ways for you to network or ways for uh, you to position yourself in a, in a, in a better place? I can uh, start off on that. Um... For me, it's been so interesting to see sometimes the networking you're doing, you have no idea where it's going to lead to in the future. So like for me, some of the connections I've made with people who are not really even in the nutrition field per se is my local county extension. They deal a lot with ag and um, the community. And now they fund one of my classes. I've also, um, the you know, like the university I went to for grad school um, like getting to know ac people in academia is really important. And then lastly, um, I would say 
or I have two more, the hospital I worked at, like you just, even though maybe you've moved on to a new job, keep those connections, keep those relationships because um, you never know down the road. All of these people I'm mentioning now help fund my classes. And I would have never known that five years ago, of course, but um, yeah, I think that any anyone that you work with or make a connection with um, is a valid connection just some examples. Also my farmer's market association has been another one too. Excellent. So for me, you know, I, I told you guys earlier that I grew up in a household where my parents, like their green thumb, thumb was on point, but I was like, we're in America. Like what y'all doing? I didn't pay attention to anything that they were doing when they were growing mm-hmm. all the foods that they were growing. So now in my adulthood, I wish I had, and I'm learning as I go along about being sustainable and growing my own food. And so basically just I I would say just about everyone that I've networked with to learn more I have not been in you know a dietitian or someone who's in professional in the nutrition space it has been people who because I live in Georgia and you know there's a lot of farms out here but in the city there's a lot of community gardens Um, and in your area you may be able to find community gardens as well you don't have to live and farm area, there are community, guard, community gardens everywhere. And if there is not, you know, you can look into starting one yourself, um, you know, and, and so for me, my networking has been people outside of the nutrition space to learn and, and find out how to be better and do better and what I'm trying to do with just my own personal stuff for me to be able to pass that information on to others. Yeah, same here. Mine has been outside of dietetics um, through different food policy councils. So in LA, there's a pretty big food policy council here. Your city might have a food policy council as well, where they connect a lot of different community organizations. And then also through the local government, um, they might have some initiatives that are happening that are funding community gardens, are funding you know different programs in the sustainability space that you can become more involved in. So there are a lot of different routes, um, even through like the medical school where they might want to. I taught a class with a USC medical school where we weaved in community nutrition um, into their medical school program. So there are a lot of different opportunities that you can build um, within the space, but outside the nutrition, you know, just the RD space. Excellent, thank you. And I'm curious, again, I have one final question before we'll go to some of our listener questions, but I know for myself, this can be, these can be dark times, uh, whether it's related to equity, racism, um, violence, discrimination, um, climate crisis issues, a lot of us are struggling with that. And I'm curious if you all have a, a story or a moment um, where you have felt a, a, a hint of hope in your life uh, about someone you worked with or a situation you were in that has continued to give you joy and inspiration to continue the work that you're doing. Maybe it was a project you worked on or an initiative in the work that you're in currently or a person whose experience affected you in some way? I would say, again, you know, I'm the one that without the professional um, experience here, you know, every time I, I teach someone my ways or what I've done and they come back at me and they're like, oh my gosh, it was so easy to grow these potatoes that you were telling me about, or, oh my gosh, I have cayenne pepper from the backyard. Like that, right there it motivates me and it makes me feel like just a little bit that I'm doing is something because they will then pass that information on to someone and it will continue and then you know what I the little bit that I you know started you know will catapult excellent mm-hmm. and I'm excited about growing cayenne pepper in my backyard I didn't, didn't know that was possible I might be uh, emailing you later <laughs> <laughs> Um, Yeah, I I think just anyone who I've talked to that is excited about, you know, learning a little bit more. um, I learned from everyone that I talked to as well. So I think that so many people are just interested in becoming more sustainable. And, you know, this conversation, um, speaking to different clients, um, speaking to different, different people in the community, everyone's interested in learning in some way. And, I think all of that momentum is 
really positive and, you know, it, you know, you know, helps us, encourages us to know that we're doing the right thing and going in the right direction. Sustainability is hot, people, literally <laughs> and figuratively. Fallon, how about you? Um, man, so many, so many stories I could share, of course, working with kids and cooking with people. People tell me stories every day, which is um, hopeful to just, I don't know, anytime you break food, or break bread with people, stories come out immediately. Um, but I would just say like in my, in my cooking classes I've been doing, just when I like take a moment to look at everyone cooking together, smiling, having conversations, um, it, it just gives me hope that food has such a strong power to um, connect people of different cultures, of different backgrounds, of different income, of you know so many different um, experiences. So that gives me hope and um, I'm sure we all uh, know the power of food here. So it's pretty, pretty impressive. Absolutely. Well, thank you uh, for answering those questions. I'm now going to pass it on to Bretta to take some questions from our listeners and I'll be back uh, at the end of the, the event. Thanks. All right. So we have a couple questions from our listeners. So the first one is, are there any must go to conferences for people interested in sustainable um, culinary nutrition? So anything you guys have attended that you think is really worthwhile? I think Menus of Change is a really good one. They had that available online last year. So that's hosted by uh, the Culinary Institute of America. So if you want to go, I could put the link in the chat. Oh, that's awesome. That'd be a great. really great one. I haven't gone to any. Do you have any like resources since you recommend um, some gardening to people, any resources that are kind of your go-to resources for some simple gardening or maybe like the easiest vegetable you have people grow? I, I got started out, the, everyone told me the easiest vegetable to grow um, was potatoes. It was like the easiest thing to grow was potatoes. So I started out with growing, cause I started last year with my bug garden in my backyard. I started growing sweet potatoes and russet potatoes. And then I did, um, you know, I talk about the cayenne pepper a lot but I have cayenne pepper in my backyard, tomatoes, um, my mom sent, my mom is in Florida. I grew up in Florida. So she sent me a banana tree <laughs> and I have that in my backyard now, hoping that it does something in Georgia. Cause we have a, a colder climate, but it's really hot right now. So I'm hoping I get some bananas before it gets cold. Um, I, I, I've done a lot of, um, Googling. I've done a lot of Googling. I've done a lot of YouTube. There's so many YouTubers out there who, um, are doing such awesome work. Um, and the information that and how they're teaching others how to grow and just about anything. I mean, I've heard people growing stuff out of an old couch, like they just ripped it apart. And then the inside of the couch is what they grew, grew potatoes in. So um, YouTubing has been one of like um, my best educational tools that I use to, to teach me how to do what in the climate that I'm in. Cause you know, everything is with zoning and stuff with zone you're in. So that has helped me a lot. Awesome. I love it. So accessible to just being able to jump on and figure it out. Fallon, do you have any other suggestions on like some fun educational opportunities for sustainable culinary nutrition? Good. Yeah. I think, I think like in, in my example, um, similar to what Shereen was saying, I, I knew I wanted to get involved with the academy, which is um, if you're a dietitian or um, even a nutrition undergrad student, you can get involved. Um, and that allowed me to really meet, um, I'm now the chair of the hunger and environmental um, dietetic practice group. Um, and it allowed me to like meet more people in that group, um, which was like an incredible networking, you know, experience for me for the last five years and continues to be. Um, so I don't think it has to be. So the, the one for dietitians is called Fancy. Um, but no matter like what your interest is, find a conference that you that you want to, they're expensive usually. So like find a conference that you want to go to and really make the most of it. Network, meet people, join an interest group um, and really like take advantage. So I would say like almost don't spread yourself too thin because there's so many conferences these days. Like pick a couple and like really make the most of it would be um, my advice. 
Definitely. Yeah. It's really easy to get sucked in and going to a whole bunch of things. And with everything being online too, it's all, it's a little harder to like commit to some of those things to actually show up. So yeah, be intentional about it. Awesome. Well, um, from Allison, uh, Dinkovic, we, she asks, um, she, She's a dietitian who started in clinical and in, she's in a long-term care facility and she's been there for a few years. She works um, as a food service distributor and she wants to make a shift into a career in sustainable nutrition, but some of the jobs she's applied for, uh, she doesn't have the right experience that they're looking for. So do you guys have any suggestions or advice that you would give to her to help her um, build and gain experience in sustainable nutrition in order to shift into that career? Like what skills should we be looking for to make the shift into um, a sustain sustainable nutrition career? I can take a stab at that. Um, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that a lot of these like sustainable nutrition jobs don't exist. Like it's not, it's a very new term and um, most like typical dietitian jobs, even nutrition professional jobs um, usually don't have the word sustainability like in it or next to it. It's definitely um, newer. So I think you have to really think outside the box. Um, like for me, I uh, didn't, go to like my undergrad dietetic internship really didn't have a sustainability focus at all. So I had to seek out some um, experience. Like I did food core, volunteering on farms. Um, I think what Shireen mentioned before of getting involved in like a food um, and policy, I did that too here in Albuquerque. Um, like policy opens up lots of doors to who you can meet and who you can maybe volunteer with. Um, I know volunteering sometimes isn't ideal because you want to get paid for it, but that can sometimes like get your foot in the door of a possible job in the future. Um, so uh, another thing I would say too is like, I think you said you're in long-term care. I've seen a lot of dietitians who are bringing sustainability into where they are now. So if that's clinical, um, mm -hmm. like working with your food service department in your hospital or wherever you are um, to work you know, with local purveyors or food service. Um, so like, how can you bring sustainability where you are now? Um, I think is also a really interesting perspective on that. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I mean, on the weekends when I was first starting out, just reaching out to the local department of public health, they were hosting different events like Ask the RD at a lot of all the different farmers markets. So that's all on the weekend. If you do have time to do that, um, that's another good way to get some experience and do some networking at the same time. And um, there also might be some paid opportunities as well. If you are able to, you know, as a dietitian, you're, you already have a base of knowledge. So a lot of people are seeking that information. Um, where you can utilize that, you know, at, at these events, or if you're able to volunteer, um, volunteering for those as well. So I, I um, started out in long-term care, as I told you guys earlier, and I know it can be a little tricky trying to get, um, I guess your foot wet, so to speak, while you're still in long-term care and introducing sustainable practices, especially with the residents and the elderly population there, um, depending on, you know, what protocols they have, it may be hard to say, you know, let's start a garden, you know, that the kitchen can use and all that stuff. But you can try to see where you're at, what the laws are, what the protocols are, and if you can do that. And in Georgia, in Gwinnett County, where I'm at here, I'm also one of my contracts is being the um, senior center dietitian. So I'm the go-to dietitian when they need someone for their senior centers. And I'm just finding out that this year, I found this out that they um, uh, have like um, community gardens where seniors can participate in. So having that background in the geriatric community, if you can you know, try to find that in your community, um, contact whomever to find out if there is if there are community gardens in your community and with your background, that could be a great um, way for you to be able to get your foot in the door with your knowledge of geriatric nutrition and then, you know, get into the um, community garden area. You can try to see if you can get in that way as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I, just to add to all of that, I think if you're looking for a job, it's just about selling your previous experience. So just making it, uh, altering it a little bit or making it sound good to help uh, Mm -hmm. put the spotlight on you for that position. So to kind of follow up with that, another person asked, um, what careers in sustainability would you recommend for people who don't have the RD credential? I feel like there there can be a lot. Um, depends on what area of sustainability you're interested in. Is it the policy aspect? Is it more of the community nonprofit aspect? Um, those are all different areas. You don't necessarily have to be an RD to to work in. Um, there are a lot of opportunities. Perfect. Yeah. Anyone else have any other suggestions? I would just say don't let that hold you back because Mm -hmm. um, like in some ways you might, you know, like I think sometimes people see dietitian and maybe they're not looking for dietitian per se, it could be an advantage, right? Um, But on the flip side, if you are a dietitian and doesn't say dietitian on there, what Bretta said, you might have to like kind of make your case for why you could be a good fit. So dietitian or not, um, I think it really is all about like making your case for why you'd be a good fit. I agree to both of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, for uh, like all the, before I became a dietitian, I was just trying to, you know, get ex- experience anywhere I could and in spaces that I was interested in. So with the public health department, mm-hmm. um, I didn't know anybody there. I just reached out to anyone I could find and then, you know, and bugged them until I got an internship. Um, but you know, it's just, there's, there's a lot of different areas that you can try and, and and experience and work in, um, where you don't have to be a dietitian at that time. I didn't know I wanted to be a dietitian. So. Awesome. And then if you had to recommend a resource to better understand kind of the food system as a whole and sustainable nutrition, um, if you guys wouldn't mind sharing what that resource would be for our listeners. For me, for me, it would be webinars because I mean, right now that's what, you know, we're all doing is um, learning things online and that's how I'm getting um, a lot of information when it comes to, um, you know, getting more information about sustainability is going to webinars and finding um, ones that are really focused on sustainability and learning more. Um, I think that's a great tool. Yeah, same. I mean, I, I think there isn't just one thing, but you know, webinars, I put in a link earlier from a growing culture where they have um, a whole series on hunger for justice. So it just also depends on what area you're interested in, but they really focus on equity, farm worker rights. And I really am fo- focused on that aspect of sustainability. So um, they talk to all different populations. There's also another great podcasts by Food Tank and they interview different people in the food system from all different aspects. So that could be another one as well. Yeah, I think um, there's so many good podcasts out there right now. Um, And I would say like, because sustainability encompasses so much, um, like I think there's some, it's helpful sometimes to like Kind of find what part of sustainability do you want to focus more on and um i'll just kind of like echo what i said before finding the people who are really doing boots on the ground work and um like whether it's a farmer or someone who's working in like water quality um like people who are really in that um in doing that work every single day uh you know seeing what what their take on is on and like sustainability is ever-changing and controversial. So (laughs) getting multiple perspectives and then making your own informed decision is also like difficult, but important, I think. Awesome. Well, that is it for our audience questions. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. I just wanna thank all of our speakers again for um, coming and sharing your experience with all of us. And one second and I will unpit or unspotlight all of you. <laughs> so you can relax for a second. 
Awesome. So if you guys, thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it. We love seeing all the new faces here and some of recurrent faces. Um, we're going to be hosting this multiple times. So this is a series and we'll have some different speakers each time. So feel free to go back to the event, Bright, and try and enroll in some of the upcoming events. But if you're interested in getting involved with the Planetary Health Collective, um, we have a Facebook group that I put in the chat and we'll we add that and sorry i'm trying to do too many things at once so you can join our facebook group um we also have a survey which is not in the chat but it is in our facebook group so feel free to let us know what kinds of things you want to see from the planetary health collective in the future um, if you're interested in campaigning with us please reach out our email is hello at planetaryhealthcollective.org. You can always apply for a leadership position and we do have some openings or if there's just something that you're really, really passionate about, we'll happily kind of create a position for you to pursue your passions there. Um, you can also become a writer for us. We're revamping our whole website, but we'll be adding some new blog content. So if you want to contribute as a writer, we would love to have you. And then um, any kind of volunteering you want to do with us, whether it's connecting on social media, um, you know, maybe being a guest at one of our events, we would love to just connect. So join our Facebook group, follow us on Instagram at the Planetary Health Collective, and we'd love to continue to like foster this community. Thanks again, everybody. And thanks to our wonderful panelists uh, for spending time with us today. We so appreciate your, your wisdom and experience and, and personal story. So thank you for that. And I think Aita is just going to close us out with who's going to be on our panel next August or this August rather. Um, Aita, you want to just give us one quick peek into uh, next yes. month? Yes, yes. So somebody asked a question, you know, how can I get involved in the climate crisis or how can I help get involved in this movement if I'm not a dietitian? So one of our speakers at the next panel, which is going to be on August 17th, the exact same time, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, is an anti-oppression vegan who works in nutrition communications and tracks nutrition policy and food related label laws that influence how the public perceives what sustainability really means. So what does it mean for to be a pasture raised, to be an egg that comes from pasture raised chicken? You'll know, like it's really confusing and kind of furthers the divide and what foods are accessible to folks, which ones are overpriced, not sure why they're overpriced, what it really means. We're going to be back to that topic um, at our next event on August 17th. And we're also going to have a registered dietitian turned organic farmer named Amanda Torrio joining us next week, or not next week, at our next session as well. So that'll be Kayla Kaplan and Amanda Torrio and one more surprise guest. <laughs> so stay tuned. And if you want to join us, please feel free to register to one or, you know, a few of our next panel events. And we look forward to seeing you guys there and connecting on social. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks so everybody much. for joining Thank us. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much for being here. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Take care.